everybody who's here this evening. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Yolanda de Riego. I know that some of you in the audience are already very familiar, deeply familiar with Yolanda and with her work, but I know many others of you for whom this will be an introduction. This is your first time to meet Yolanda and to see her work. So I'm excited about introducing you all tonight. Um, I also know that some of you will be more or less familiar with the techniques of printmaking. And so tonight will be a bit of an introduction to a lot of terminology. And because we only have a short amount of time, we'll just have a little taste of the world of printmaking, which is very deep and very rich. But we'll, we'll be using some terms and we'll try to explain them as we go along. But at the end, if you have any questions or you want to ask Yolanda, anything about her, her work in the 1970s in Alaska, we'll open the floor to questions after making a bit of a presentation. Um, if we were to really do a deep dive into Yolanda's career and her artistic output, we would need to be here together for many days. <laughs> but tonight we only have an hour or so, and we're going to have a taste. We're going to get to choose to look at just a select amount of work. And we've invited her here to talk about what she was doing in the 1970s when mm -hmm. she was immersing, immersing herself in the world of printmaking for the first time. Yolanda, as an artist, identifies to this day primarily as a printmaker. Mm -hmm. So we're going to learn tonight a bit about what that means, what it means to be engaged with printmaking, because printing is a world unto itself. There is a whole range of techniques, and we'll just have a taste of that tonight. Um, to explain why Yolanda found herself in the United States in the first place, in the 1960s, she was married to an American officer in the Air Force. And in the 1970s, in the early 70s, mm -hmm. they were living on the East Coast in New Hampshire, New Hampshire yeah. and raising a young family. And in 1973, it was decided that the family would move to Anchorage, Alaska. And so that's where we're going to take you this evening. We'd like to take you to Alaska in the 1970s, as seen through the eyes of a Spanish expatriate and artist. And so together, we're going to present some of the highlights of Yolanda's work from this period, from approximately 1973 to 1980. And at the end, we welcome questions from the audience. Now, yes. before we travel to Alaska, Yolanda, okay. I want to ask you a preliminary question. And that is, what role did art play in your life even before the move to Alaska? Well, I was a painter. And in New Hampshire and Maine, there are many art associations. So I, was in, I, I met them, and I we used to go out painting sometimes. And it was fun. I, I learned some basic things. That's about it. No printmaking. <laughs> no printmaking yet. <laughs> I was very, I, I just didn't know that I wanted to paint people. I was always a landscape painter. <laughs> but you didn't know it until you got there. And yeah. so in 1973, your family makes this odyssey. You make a big trip. Oh, it's an odyssey, all right, yeah. Uh, we were given the choice uh, to, because Bill Heller, my husband, was an officer, a young officer, and the Vietnam War came. So they decided that, well, he could either go to Vietnam because he had a, a low rank, he was a captain, and, or choose something else. And they said, how about Alaska? <laughs> I said, yeah, let's go to Alaska. That sounds like an adventure that I would like to have. It was a beautiful trip. Really, it's etched in my heart, all of these landscapes. That's all I can say. So you arrive in Anchorage. In Anchorage. In, in 1973. Yeah. And what were your first impressions? Well, it was a smaller, I, it was larger than I thought and smaller than I, than I found, you know, because you could mm -hmm. meet people easy. And as you're making art when you first arrive in Anchorage, mm -hmm. you're continuing to work with traditional life drawing? Well, I didn't have too much, I had a little light drawing uh, in, in New Hampshire, but uh, this was a special class because this, he was a very good teacher. And uh, in fact, there is a small anecdote about my character that he went to, uh, he went to touch my, you know, we had a, an easel, each one, and I was drawing, and it's pastel. So he took 
he took one, he had up, and he was going to draw me my painting, and I said, don't you dare. <laughs> this is my work. If you want to show me something, tell me what I have to do, and then I will learn. And that's my attitude. I wanted my art to be mine, to develop my own style. You know, it's difficult. So much has been done, but it's good. <laughs> so oh. here you are. Yeah, this is, well, in Anchorage, one thing that is also is always present are the mountains. White cap mountains, it was just beautiful. It was something that it, in anybody's, with any sensitivity, you will just be taken by this. This landscape is just, for me, unico. And mm -hmm. I have traveled a little. And it starts to, oh. it starts to filter into your work. Yeah. Because we start to see. Well, this is a drawing because when I, I would take um, the car and go out, away, very few kilometers, maybe 20, 30, along this highway, uh, and uh, I would stop, uh, put the window down, and take ink. <laughs> and of course, the water came in and did me a favor, then I had blue ink in there. I would draw what I would see. And I, I could only see lines and mountains, and these little trees, are, were, they're really fantastic. You can see them even today in my work. These trees are the ones that grow in permafrost. Mm -hmm. So they have very few roots, they're shallow roots, and uh, well, I love them. I just don't have nice, I've never seen anything like that. They're very scrawny. Yeah, no leaves, no leaves. Rugged. Yeah. Rugged, yeah, I don't know how to call it. And so this place was near where you live? Yeah. This was very close to my house, and we could go there, just the girls and I, walking, and, and uh, but this, these trees and the landscape, it's, so different, so amazing, the lights. Well, what strikes me is that you're not trying to copy the way it no. looks, maybe optically, what, what we no. see in terms of, no. we imagine a kind of three-dimensional space. What you're doing is looking at landscapes like no. this. Yeah, with pen and ink it's easy to do that because you don't fill in all the spaces like with an oil painting, you know, and so, yeah, that was, that was the way I, I saw it and of course, Color inks also help because help because uh, I, I noticed that if I had watercolor and a drop would fall in, <laughs> it becomes something else. So I did pen and ink. So what happens when you're in Anchorage, Alaska? You're studying art, but then you have this opportunity to apply. Yeah, to, to apply the to the Visual Art Center, Center of Alaska. That is a, a one, I think it's one of a kind place to be. If, if you want to be an artist, and, and you go to a place where the best artists in the United States would be invited to come and to present, you know, do a, a workshop. Sometimes there were five days, sometimes there were a month. And when you were getting that intimacy with these teachers and they were showing everything they have and sharing it with you, it's, to me, it's incredible. It's just, it's just a dream. And this work that we're seeing on the screen, the work on the right, yeah. you submitted oh. this. Well, to go into the school as a, as a, as a member, member mm -hmm. you would have to present something that you did in metal, so etching, because it was only that. There was no painting as such. So, uh, well, one of the young men that was very nice, Neil Meglish, he said, don't worry, I will come and bring you a plate and bring you the tool that you need to do, and you scratch it any way you can, and I will try to print it for you. He had to do it because I had no access to the press. And this was your first introduction my, to printing? My first introduction. So I thought these trees are so beautiful and linear so that I will just, hmm. no, it, it was really, I find all of this almost like if it's destiny because <laughs> I don't know how I could do it, but he was a very nice guy. And the photograph that we see is of you with with a sculpture, but a, you didn't make the sculpture. No, I didn't. This was in the, in the, in the small gallery go, going to the center. People mm -hmm. could, in fact, that we had patrons and people that sometimes gave some money to the, to the center. Mm -hmm. And the show, most of the time, was of the members, but not all the time. And this guy was, uh, yeah, he did this. And he said, Yolanda, would you pose for me? I need someone to hold it. So they see it's a bird that is going to fly away, <laughs> and you're holding it. <laughs> And there are workshops with a variety of different types of printmakers. Right. So can you take us on a tour here? What oh, is Bill Kimura. This? He was uh, 
He was a Japanese man who was the director, technical director of the of the Visual Arts Center because you needed some technical person to to change to, to clear some doubts because when you're using acids and all this this sort of thing and machines. So. And so dry point on copper plate. Yeah, this is one of the first things that they said to me that I could start. Mm -hmm. This is how after I had that the first one with Neil Meglish. Uh, giving me the tools, yeah, I decided this was kind of simple. If you just take a copper plate, you keep it very clean, you don't put fingers in there, and because the ink will not, you know, the ink will not go evenly, and in this time, black and white was great. Mm -hmm. When you have a, a thick line, you can choose to, to push harder in the plate, and then your line will be, will remain, the burr will be, the burr is the little, you remove part of the, of the copper. And uh, uh, there is a small part that you can control by uh, also saying, I'm going to finish here clean, or I will go on mm -hmm. in, in a shape. And it's difficult to control because sometimes you, you don't want that much black and you can't go back. <laughs> right, you can't erase that. <laughs> Lino cuts. This is another, I think, is our greatest invention. Uh, linoleo, that used to be the, the one we, we would get there, was called button ship linoleum or something. It had a special quality mm -hmm. that it wasn't so soft or so hard and it would crack when mm. you, when you, so you have a different tools for this. And uh, well, uh, I, I, since I like to do things <laughs> my own way, okay, I decided that the what was white would be black. So you do that because this is a surface. You just, it's a, with the linoleum, you just, you paint the surface with rollers. And First you cut, you make your design, and you, then? No, you, you, well, you, you could, yeah, but you could also make it all black and remove it with linoleum, it's easier. Okay. Lino cut is probably the easiest thing, I think it's what they teach for children. Oh, okay. I believe so. I, but then again, if, if you get more involved and you want to cut the shapes, you leave the little white line, you have to make it like a puzzle, a puzzle, no? Mm -hmm. So, and to me that was very much fun. Oh. Yeah, Toshi Yoshida. Well, he was a fantastic person because he was doing, he was very famous in Japan and he was, his work was sold very expensive. Uh, he had high prices. He comes from a family of traditional. So he said, you can, you can print, you don't need a, a printing, a, you don't an etching press. No. So all these things here, these are tools that you can use to, to put the paint, the color inside the grooves, which is called intaglio, when you do it in, with metal, or the surface, and, 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 and it was, it's fantastic. You don't have to have a lot of, a lot of cool tools to, to do that. And so he was with me especially patient <laughs> because he would come and he was very calm. <laughs> and I just, I just used to, I think he taught me that in the traditional Japanese printmaking, uh, they have each one has the stylography too. They, they have one plate for one color mm -hmm. and another one for another color. And that way the colors wouldn't mix. And you also mentioned to me that um, in traditional Japanese printmaking, there's fairly strict division of labor that yeah. one person yeah. is given one particular task. Yeah. And he would ink that plate alone. And so each, then they had to have a, a way of, uh, well, you make a, a, like a, lines where you would have to put inside there like a template mm -hmm. and then you put your plate and so that if it moves <laughs> it will have a very dirty edge. Well, Jules Heller, he is fantastic. He came and he stayed in Fairbanks and he gave a very long workshop and he also... So he didn't come to Anchorage, uh, no, no. you went to him. I went to him and uh, the first, I, I, since it was like 500 kilo, I don't know if it's miles or kilometers, but in, in Anchorage I mean, in that weather, it's pretty long trip. So, so anyway, I would go and stay there. And um, he, at the beginning of the class, I, I, I said to him, "May I stay? I don't have to go home. I, I'm, I'm out of my home. Can I stay longer and help you clean the plates that we use today?" He says, "Oh, of course I can." He says, "May I ask you a question?" I said, "Can I call you something else? Because if I call you Mrs. Heller, <laughs> I will be like talking to my wife." So I said, "Of course you." And, he is one of the, I really admire, loved what he did. And in fact, in those days, no one, I, there was no, you, you couldn't order through Amazon or anything. No. So he helped me set up my studio. 
by saying what I would need and what I wouldn't need. And he was in search of keep on traveling to find how they made paper everywhere in the world. So th this is why he published this book, Paper Making, and the other one is Spring Making today. Uh, he's fantastic. I just couldn't say any more than he shared everything he could and more. I think I, that's so interesting what you mentioned about how he, he would help you set up a studio yeah. in terms of, All you know, things. here's what you need and wow. this is where you can obtain these things. Otherwise, because how, yeah. at that point in time, yeah, how yeah. else would you, <laughs> how, would, how would you do it? I don't think you could. Yeah. To tell you the truth, he spent a lot of time with me telling me what, what etching press did I need, I need to buy. And in those days, I bought the French American. It was a, a much bigger press than what I have in, in mm -hmm. Madrid, because I couldn't live without a press. Now, this <laughs> is lithography. Yeah, Can you workshop. explain to us what lithography it's is? It's what I am the worst explaining it, because, of course, we started this Bob Overman, Overman came. He said, if you're going to handle, you come and do this etch, you etch the, the, it's a limestone. It's a soft, yes. soft stone. And so you have to put very carefully where you want to have your whites and all that. And I, I said, I, I just don't have what it takes. This, I, I would like to be, do this at home. How can I lift this, this slab? <laughs> and you have some way of um, putting a blocker of the ink because you know, like all oil and water do not mix. Mm -hmm. So when you, have, um, when you have a clean plate like this, extremely clean and you don't touch it, uh, you, can, you can draw also with a coal. They coal. are mm -hmm. lithop pens or yeah. pencils that are grease, black grease. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you, you drew there, and then you would have to be how you want to uh, take it out. And with a little, it was very little acid. It was, I don't, I don't know, it was just very little. All these mixtures of things, I have recipes handed to me, like if it was a cookbook, because, well, Did you study chemistry? Yeah, no, I didn't study chemistry. You had to <laughs> learn it as you went. No, it was, it, they call it, it's like a kitchen. Mm -hmm. But this was delicate, because you would have to just remove a little bit at a time and and to keep the white white you didn't want to touch it again with your finger or anything so and i did like those trees very much it was suitable and there's always you see always a left or a right mountain the slope because this is what i have inside of me i just see all the time that run that, that drive around mm -hmm. turn again lee chesney he was fantastic he used he was the director in the university of hawaii and he said mm -hmm. he went there, he was kind of like a hippie, <laughs> always with a nice hat that he was, he was very easy going. And, uh, and, and with him, again, Lee Chesney, it's each one of these people, since we had such small workshops, they were like family. I mean, you just didn't even need any friends. <laughs> you stay all the time in the studio doing things. And they would come by your studio too. Oh, yeah. Now, this is a spectacular Viscous. image. Can you explain oh, how this, you made yeah. it? Yeah, you could mix, you could make a plate with different levels, which you need for viscosity printing, because the viscosity comes because you change the viscosity, like you put more certain grease, then it would rechazaba. You just, you go over that mm -hmm. with a, roll, a roller, and, and it would, and so. So that the different pigments kind of reject no, each the, other? No, the different levels. Or the pigment applied to different levels uh -huh. becomes almost uh, uh, impossible to mix when you just put them through a press with some blankets on top, which also mm -hmm. you had to order someplace else. Everything is special for pre-making. Yeah. There is no such a thing as, well, I'll go buy this. Yes. But, but this, 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 this is interesting because if you don't have this technique, your, your yellow and blue will become green. First image we see on the left, uh -huh is simply yeah. an intaglio print. It's an intaglio, it's just, an intaglio just lines with, with etched in acid. But then you start to play with what's called chine -cole. Chine -cole. Cole. This is Mishkons that he said to me he was too lazy <laughs> to put color any other way. Because why would you bother with all these, you know? These Pigments and inks, yeah, yeah. And all of this. So no, what said, does he do? You cut the paper with the shapes you want it to be into the work. Right. And so you spend a lot of time, but before you painted the paper with rollers in it, with the solid ink. Right. So you would prepare your, all your little pieces to go into the chine -cole. And he invited me, he was in California, and uh, he was a teacher in, uh, in the, I think it's California State University. I, I went to visit him, he said, you have to come to my studio and see how I do it in my studio. 
And, and I so went how does the colored paper adhere to okay. the... <laughs> That's a good question. Okay, uh, you have to have blotters. When you have a blotter and you put several blotters with, with a spray, you go very little water depending on what you have. Depending on the, on the strength of the Japanese paper you were going to use, some of them are not, pos it's not possible because as long as you, as long as you put a finger, the, it, it if it's is. very thin. So the paper had to be koso or so very strong. Mm -hmm. And it could be Japanese or something else. I just never found one that was so pliable to the, to the edges, mm -hmm. you know, that you could, so you never cut them with scissors, that's one thing. You had to tear them so they would have this, this nice finish. For some works, it's important. For others, for me, at this time, it wasn't. I just, I just did whatever I wanted. Mm -hmm. But the, the color has to be clean. And you first make it in black. Mm -hmm. You decide what shapes do you want to put the, the shin de cole. Well, here, I just had a black at home, and so I colored it with pencils. With pencils. Which, by the way, is the first thing I drew with colored pencils, lapices de colores. <laughs> My first material. My first material. Yeah. And interestingly, this is this one that we're seeing now on the left. Yeah. Has a date of 2014. So yeah. something that you started with, the germ of this idea <coughs> was in the 70s. Well, and it's I, something that's been. I color it because I see I have a, uh, an architect's, I don't know how you call it, is to put very big planos, you know? Yes. I, and big I have drawers. three story, three story high, I cannot. Can only get to here. So everything I start, I keep there. And sometimes I don't know what to do. I go there and I say, well, let me see what, I, what else I can do with this. <laughs> I'll revisit this. And although this I'll is made in Alaska, we can see that this looks very Spanish, actually. Yeah. I, was, I got into, I have several in my house that they were like castillos mm -hmm. in my memory. You know, if yeah. you go to Siguenza or you go someplace and you see these mm -hmm. beautiful buildings and you say, oh, the towers, you know. And, and I always, it's like if my memory is not good when I don't remember names, but I do remember objects and things that strike my, my mind. And yeah. I just now we were, you were just talking about the paper and about the, the, the pliability or the weight of the paper. Oh. And paper is something you also learned a lot about. Well, with Jules Heller, he, he, he said, you can also take good quality paper, tear it apart, and then you put it, well, I used to use my blender and blend it with water, not too much, and then the little pieces of paper that were colored will come into your, in your homemade paper. But it was difficult. You had to have a place to lay in a tray, and this Neil Meglish made me a, in mm -hmm. fact, I have his plano. Uh, you had to have a wooden thing that you could put on top of a screen. Yeah. And so when you, uh, you had all this pulpo, pulpa, yeah. Uh, you would, you would, you may want to put something, which I did, so little pieces of paper underneath. But you're talking here when I color the pulp myself with pigmento and polvo, and then you could, then you your own composition. You don't need the chine cole. Right. But they had to be very simple. <laughs> no room for a small detail there. Mm. You can touch this paper. I have some at home, and they're usually very small. And we also did make a excursiones, excursiones to reach, to go in the field, work around, and, and see if you could find any of the plants that could have cellulose, because cellulosa is, is cellulose, in, in plants. Yeah. Yeah. And then you had to do, it was a, I really didn't like it because you had to use lye and, and kind of like clean, and then yeah. blend it. And there things. was a whole, I don't remember the name, because I never, a Hollander, maybe we are Hollander? Uh, it, it was a huge, if you were going to make up a big edition or, or if you want to sell paper. But I just did these little things because they were easy to put, you know. And who was Catherine Lipke? Well, Catherine Lipke was a Canadian woman that uh, she did a workshop on paper. Hmm. And, uh, and I- In Alaska. In Alaska. Mm -hmm. She was a very interesting woman and, and she was very willing to teach what she knew. Yeah. Ah, yes, we've got several of your experiments with <laughs> making paper. Yeah. And you used it, some of it was like a work of art in itself, and some of it you used as the, as the base or the support for etchings or yeah. drawings. And this is why the, you see the edges are ragged because I would hate to cut them. Uh, you pour this into this into a screen. screen. Yeah. yeah. And I have one that is very complicated at home and because I call it, because it even had buttons and things. And this is your first press. Yeah. yeah. Your first in the press. garage, everything 
that everybody in America <laughs> in those days became famous. They were working in the garage. <laughs> Like it, yeah, in the United that. States or in Canada, very rarely do you actually have a car in your garage. I know. You usually have everything else in your garage. But it's much more, more peaceful. The children <laughs> usually don't go there. It's a good place to work. And so this was your studio. My studio in my garage, yeah. And this press was very, very beautiful, but yet I couldn't bring it because I knew that if I brought it to Spain, I wouldn't have a, in an apartment. I couldn't. I would have to go to a Polygon Industrial. <laughs> One that's here is the one Yolanda had in the garage in the garage in Alaska, and it was very big because I wanted to do bigger works. But when I came to Spain, they said to me, "Well, you would not like I said, you couldn't put this in a house, in a in a in a piso." So I ordered a Charles Brown, and you waited. I waited seven years for that etching press to get here, to get to Spain. We could have a whole other talk another night about what Yolanda did in those seven years when she did not have a printing press because she had to find other things to do. <laughs> but that's for another night. <laughs> so here's the print that she's pulling off the press in the previous photograph. Conceptual, yeah. Well, I call it conceptual because it was not really a landscape. I did, here I had the line engraving is with, with a buril, very technical. You, 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 push and you take whatever line you take if you if you put if you put your weight of your hand to the left or to the right you will have a burr and if you leave the two burrs very difficult to ink and a burr is like a shaving of metal a shaving very little like shaving. a curl and when you do it when you wipe your with hands your hands end up almost could be cut yeah but anyway i did the the part that i wanted to did like the background stay down and I had a roll, I also had a, a, a rainbow roll with the viscosity printing technique because I inked this, this part on the foreground, it was viscosity printing. So I did my etching normally and it had the depth that it had to do. And I applied a mi gusto, the different <laughs> colors. And since there is a space in between, you, you don't have necessarily to mix the blue with the red, you know but with a rainbow, and then I had a rainbow here that was light yellow, I needed some light color there, you know. This is all a matter of color. And there I was. So this is a lino cut, mm -hmm. that I decided that since the lino, the linoleum I was having was kind of pliable, and it didn't crack when you cut it with a scissor or with something easy, because I don't have too much strength. So I would, I cut, first of all, what I would say would be the part, the aerial part. So a red shape, that I would only ink with a soft roller, softly. And then I would put the blue. And in the blue, I, I cut some lines that I would print raw. And all this is a, a surface, surface inking, no? Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, by the time I had the composition, I decided that all the stuff that I love in, the, in Alaska, there were these slots, and they were really mysterious. <laughs> I, did, I put black, and the white is the lines that were not inked. Mm -hmm. because it is a surface, your only surface. And so by controlling the, the kind of roller you use and how many times you want to go, because if you do too much, it gets kind of greasy and ugly. Working on this and you're working in order to perfect a kind of technique, or are you coming first with a concept, an idea of a with, landscape or something? With a concept. No, I always did it to please myself. And I didn't have any idea what I would do with it, but I always had to feel it, mm -hmm. and, and this, this slope, this is, this is turn again, turn again on. And this? This is a copper plate, and it's very thick, and it's very heavy. I have it in my house, as you enter, you know, it's, it's one metro. And it was difficult to work with, and yeah, because I, I did the etching and all that, but it got to the point I could hardly handle it, and so I decided I had to push in the color here, because I can't. Mm -hmm. I can't ink it in a poupée or anything like that. Now this, oh. can you explain why you made this? Yes, I do. Uh, well, one of the things that we were very concerned in Alaska in those days is that the, the, sh the big ships that would come to take to kill the whales is un mamífero. Y podría llegar a la extinción? And I said, no, no, this can't be. You have to stop this. And so I did know a person that, um, that worked with torch because I wanted to maltratar this, you see this first shape in white. Yeah. It's got all kinds of stuff in there. I, put, I could put a small uh, 
uh, or tornillo or flat thing and then with a torch burning and burning and I kept thinking the poor whales, the poor whales, <laughs> to the point that the edges were almost could cut your finger. I had to file them carefully. So the other shape is more normal of what I did, you know, and it's funny, the other day I was working in art, digital art, and I had one of those shapes and it came out of the nowhere hmm. because this is something that is your, is your scenario, is your... And these shapes and these the motifs. Shapes, yeah, they, the motifs come back. Mm -hmm. You just can't get away from them. It's your dictionary. Oh, yeah. Now, this is unusual because it's a portrait. I did this because Paul Rosendahl was going... I went to visit him because Catherine was a violinist. <laughs> and so I said, would you teach my daughter? And he said, oh, no, I, only, I don't like children. So I said, well... <laughs> Can I bring her for an audition? <laughs> and he said, yes. <laughs> and he said, yes, bring her, bring her. I will take her as my, my, my pupil. pupil. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, when he, he was claiming that he did not have for this Sitka Music Festival, which is still going on, no, I, I believe. And I said, well, you know, I can help you. He said, sure, you can make me, give me one of your etchings. And I said, who is going to buy my etchings? They want your portrait. You are the one who is organizing it. You are the protagonista. So then I, he came during weeks because I was trying to do from this dark, see he had a big black thing like this. So I just really said, it's got to have deep, deep black color, but I have to lighten it up and how in the hell am I going to do it? So somehow I think what I did is, I think I had two plates or either that or I, and then I use viscosity here and then there I put the shinecole, which is the answer to any kind like, like, you know, you just, you want color? <laughs> do it in paper and, and glue it. So then we come to 1980, yeah. which was your last year in Alaska. Yeah. I was going through a divorce and I was terribly upset. I didn't know where I would go after that. I was crying all the time. So I stayed up most of the time with music in my, I had in the, the garage, we, a, a small, and I could not change the, the, the music because my, ink, my hands were dirty and I ruined those discos so what I did is I just I play over and over the same thing maybe for a week or two weeks and it really became part of my work this is a series called 22 oils in 22 days and there were in fact 22 mm -hmm. made and they're large as you can see 150 is 150 126 by yeah. 122 yeah this is and in my each house here. one was made With after a particular with that music obsessively sing, go, going on and on and me thinking, what am I going to do? <laughs> this is the only thing I know how to do. What was happening is that I made this kind of a proposition to a new gallery that was very beautiful. And so you proposed so, that... So I proposed her that I would put a number and I would paint in one night and one day this work. Mm -hmm. And then she would come and see if she liked it. And I didn't change the music and I just worked on that it was linen here this is 22 walls and 20 yeah and mm -hmm. here you see I'm well we were, this was a gallery that she liked to have music we had one of these was Kat this friend that played piano and and here is yeah this is Christina my other daughter and, and a uh, variety of musicians and a variety of musicians yes they, they, but, but, but this statement that you made for the collector's gallery was 22 walls in 22 days explains in very few words. I was going through an extreme, uh, it was better than going to a psychologist, I think. But anyway, <laughs> this was my. This was your catharsis. Yeah, catharsis, that's for sure. Yeah. And also in 1980, you produced, you were very, very productive at oh, yeah. this point. And yeah. this is the Farnsworth series. Well, Farnsworth was a very big, important uh, maker of paper in California or in the, yeah, in the West mm -hmm. Coast. And, he and I decided that I wanted to do a square. And all the, all the papers that he did, you could order. So I said, I, I sent an, 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 an order mm -hmm. to make them a square and to put a little pieces of thread or something so they would have already something to have. Some on. texture, some fiber. No, not texture, just fibers, because fibers. they were this color type. Mm -hmm. like, like if you cut uh, some kind of cotton little, that you're going to sew a button. So anyway, he did, he did a beautiful work for me. He did a beautiful paper for me, and I value it very much. I don't think I have any left. I think mm. I have used them all. And so this was the end of Alaska for you? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I met some of the people that there were musicians. <laughs> there were women musicians. There were people of all kinds. And uh, 
and you and you became friends in the visual arts center when you had a coffee. With them. So uh, one day, one summer, you have to go with us and go to Hope. We have a cabin there we can stay. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, this is when I became a very, very true feminist. <laughs> These women are all very feministas precursoras, vamos. And so, so when, when we went to Hope, the, this is the post office and also where you would have to go to buy any kind of grocery you need. And also, uh, he had next, next to that a shower. You could, you could have a shower there <laughs> because, because there was no... Because no if you're going to sleep in a cabin in yeah. Hope... Well, but the cabins, they had heat because the heat was un barril de aceite. Oh, okay. They cut one, they make a, like a chimney type so we wouldn't get sick from, from the, the wood and burn in there and it mm. goes out, out the cabin. And if you had to go to the bathroom at night, well, you may find a, a bear or something. <laughs> But you would go with, you know, and then you would go, go out and walk over. They had like a little bridge of wood, so you go to the letrina. Hmm. Muy básico. <laughs> rustic, rustic. So you left Alaska, but Alaska made a deep impression on you. It's, it's etched in my heart. And I'm sorry. So I, I just get very moving because my, my whole life I will remember that. It, it was unusual, different. The people were different, and I blended so easily. <laughs> and you learned from I learned many, many people. Yeah. And it still comes into your work. It does all the time. And um, can you explain what happens in the 2000s when you start doing something completely well, new? Yeah, well, I started, well, it was also because in the 2000s, I went to, I went to, to learn digital art. Yeah. And uh, to Seattle. And that was another experience. And I think digital art is really for the present and the future because it, it can be, people think it's a reproduction. It's not. If the artist does it all themselves, it's your work. And every little bit of pixel you put in there and you color and shapes and patterns are going to be there. So you can pour your soul in there and, and never, never end. So I like very much digital art. I think it's better for the climate. Mm -hmm. You don't have to put that on the world. Because in those places, you know, you didn't throw the acid away either, like that. Mm. I mean, if you have sulfurico. <laughs> what did you do? Well, they, for sulfurico, which is much, um, a very good, if you want a very precise etching, the sulfurico corta, and it doesn't leave any. And then you put aqua tint, which is rosin, and you burn it, and then you get your other textures. But uh, no, you just, uh, with digital art, you just have to study a lot. And I was lucky to go to Seattle, where right. Kat and her husband were Your staying. Your daughter was living in Seattle. And, and I learned with a fantastic, well, I had no idea of digital art. Mm -hmm. so, and so Alaska, Alaska has continued to... Yeah. And, the, you know, now with digital art, there are so many supports that are fantastic. If you, you, can, you can use plexiglass, you can use glass, and this is a deep, deep on, and, and, and it's really endless what you can, you can do in any... any many supports. So I simply wanted to re remind everyone of this, this drawing that was made probably in seventy. Well, it was made in the road, in the road in Alaska. And the water came in, and this is why it's got blue. It but came in through the like window. But things like that seem to inform work that's being done much more recently. Yeah. The same mountains, the same, the same. valleys, the same. I don't think you could ever end, I could never have end my, my inspiration with, with these landscapes and the things that happened there, and the, the moment in which I was. It was a special moment in Alaska. Can you tell us about this work, which is 2022? Well, yeah, well, I, this is one of the things I do now uh, in a glossy paper. It's printed, it's an, uh, something done in the computer, in glossy paper. And then I go to the kitchen and I get some tools and I rasgo todo eso como, como, me, como quiera. And so I get those white lines. With kitchen tools? Kitchen tools, yeah. So thank you very, very much, Yolanda. Thank you to all of you. It's a collaboration because you don't know what is going to happen in many cases. <laughs> you take advantage of what you can get and maybe develop it a little more. And then it goes another way and you say, oh, well, this is the way it's going to be. In the beginning,
beginning, I was kind of worrying about that. I, I thought it would be difficult, but it's not, because if you're using color, shapes, texture, and you have something that you want to do, you do it with a computer or with an iPad or an optical pen. Pen is fantastic with an iPad. I really never, I, I really never had the proportion for uh, for animals. The human body that it was only during that workshop with Pastel with Wassily that I had a live drawing class. I'm a landscape artist. I am a very uh, anarchista. I, I don't know what I want to do first or not. Sometimes I have an idea but sometimes I really don't, and uh, yo no puedo predecir qué me va a pasar al día siguiente. This is sometimes I, I'm staying up late, I would go the next morning, you know what, oh. and you just, I, I put it into acid again, I did some kind of crazy thing, and then something, you know, it, it has to happen, it has to come up. I really wanted to know was why <coughs> printmaking captured you so much when what you do often is make monoprints or singular works of art because mm. printmaking is more. typically attractive to people who want to make multiples or who want to disseminate their work in a way that's more economical. Because very often I was bored I, itself. I said, well, why do this again, you know? I, I did one. I would try something else, and then you mix it with other, mm -hmm. other things, and mm -hmm. break the plate or cut it up. And then I do, I, I to do a very big works. I do now uh, collage de grabados in big boards as, as big as that door. Mm -hmm. So my grabados are all in good paper with good ink. So I tear them and, and I save them. So I bring them out and I start gluing, and, and I, I can have a work, those metros or, or you know. Thank you so much, Yolanda, Thank you for, everyone. for sharing the work from this period of time. And I simply want to remind you all that this is just a drop in the bucket, that this <laughs> is just the work of seven years, basically, wow. in a very long and productive career. And we look forward to seeing what comes next. Well, this would not have been possible without your help and Kat's collaboration that yeah. spent hours. Thank you very, very much, yeah, to her, because she's a great helping. technician, you know. With, with because Kat <laughs> is a kind of archivist and well, has she, brought together many she, images, photographs. Without, without these two ladies, I, I don't think I could have ever had this presentation. <laughs> I, I mean, I know that. So thank you Pongo very much. Mano en el fuego. And thank, thank you, you for coming. And and thank for you to all. <laughs> and, uh, thank you.